everyone, welcome to our uh, special presentation for you. My name is Jonna Ward and I'm the CEO of the Seattle Public Library Foundation. And I'm so pleased to have you join us for the special edition of Inside Your Library on genealogy with Mahina Ushi and John Lamont. We are going to learn about some really interesting things, paths that you can use to study your family history. And as we delve into this topic today, it's really going to encourage us to look back at our history. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge our country's history and recognize the importance of the land that we are on today. The Seattle Public Library is on indigenous land. These are the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people and specifically the Duwamish people. Now we are so proud of the genealogy department that is part of Seattle Public Library's special collection. And it's really a privilege for us to be able to support this important uh, community resource. And we're really proud of the community support from so many of you that allows our special collections to be such a vibrant resource. And it helps us maintain robust collections at the library that are both around cultural and historical resources. And it really does help us answer those deep, deep questions about our history and give us a sense of who we are and our community as well. Now, before we get started, I've got a little bit of housekeeping information to share with you. Uh, first off, I want to direct your attention to the chat. It's a chat window. Uh, this is where you go if you have any technical issues. Um, it's on the bottom of the screen if you're on a laptop or a desktop, or it's at the top of the screen if you're on a tablet or your phone. And so part of my team, our foundation teammates are standing by to give you any help you might need if you have technical difficulties. So we will next be bringing forward a pre-recorded program. And then following that pre-recorded program, we will have John and Mahina with us to answer your questions. And we'll do our best to tackle as many as we possibly can. So now let's begin. And here is Lindsay. Please enjoy. Thank you so much, Jonna, and thank you supporters for being here today. Now I have the great pleasure of introducing Seattle Public Library's genealogy librarians, Mahina Oshi and John Lamont. And I would love you for, to, for you to introduce yourselves. Mahina? Hello, everybody. My name is Mahina Oshi. I am a librarian at the Seattle Public Library in the Special Collections Department, and my specialty is genealogy. I've been with the library about ooh, 12 years now, which is quite a long time now. <laughs> And I have been a genealogy librarian at the library almost the entire time I've been there. I became interested in genealogy, like many people from Hawaii do, from birth. Um, oftentimes when you're in Hawaii and you meet a new person, then one of the first things you say to somebody is, you know, where are you from and who are you? And you're trying to establish your genealogy, essentially. I also became seriously interested in starting using Ancestry.com for the first time in 2006. So my husband, I thought I would do a family tree for him for Christmas that year. And I started the research in August of that same year. I'm still not done with his tree, but I, I talked to his grandfather and I asked him for all the information I could get about the family. And he had given me his mother's name and his father's name and then his mother's husband's name. And the curiosity behind why he gave me those three people is what really spurred my genealogy interest. However, I have my own things that I like to research and I have specialties or I consider them specialties. So I really have dug deeply into Irish heritage and Irish genealogy. So I often teach a class on Irish genealogy. I have spent quite a bit of time doing German research because of my spouse's family. And so I feel like I'm pretty solid on German research as well. And as a person of Hawaiian ancestry, um, I would not call myself an expert, but I definitely feel like that's some place where I have a good deal of knowledge and I feel confident that I can direct people to the right resources. Those are my main things that I feel that I would bring to the table as a specialty. Oh, I'm sorry, Portuguese. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm like 60% Portuguese. I have four grandparents. Three of them are Portuguese. <laughs> so Portuguese, especially Portugal for the Atlantic Islands is something that I have quite a bit of knowledge about and I'm very confident in my research abilities there. John, how about you? I'm a genealogy librarian. My name is John Lamont. Uh, work at the Seattle Public Library with Mahina. I've been at the library for about 17 years now and I've uh, been doing genealogy anywhere from 25 to 30, depending on you know when you start the clock. I first got interested in genealogy when I was probably 19 or 20. I was working for an attorney 
uh, in DC and, and, you know, his mom had passed. So there was a lot of conversation about uh, uh, the estate and, uh, and the family and the history and all that. I wrote a couple letters off to my grandmothers at the time. I, I felt inspired uh, and then kind of just shelved it for a while. Uh, a couple of years later, I was living in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, um, and you know, I just ended up uh, writing some letters to some cousins, uh, an aunt who'd done some research, uh, made a visit to a genealogy library there. And then uh, when my wife and I moved out to Seattle, you know, we had the National Archives here and we had uh, this great collection at the Seattle Public Library, several uh, local genealogy societies. So um, I just dove right in. Uh, you know, I spent uh, a lot of my free time over at the archives looking at census on microfilm. Uh, running down to the the old central library and um, you know doing research there. Personally, you know you generally build up specialties around things that you've had to research yourself and you've had to spend a fair amount of time at. So my mom's family is all Norwegian, and so you know I spent quite a bit of time in the Norwegian records, uh, you know ferreting out the church books. Uh, have made a visit over there to to see the land and meet cousins who who stayed. So yeah, so I've done some classes on on beginning Norwegian genealogy research and resources on, you know, identifying uh, farm maps in Norway. So, you know, what what does that name mean? Um, uh, Norwegians took farm names as their surnames, uh, oftentimes when they emigrated. So if you have that, then, you know, you can you can track that back to a place, which is which is huge. Well, thank you so much to you both. Uh, next, I'm wondering if one of you can provide an overview of the genealogy services available at the library. As far as the genealogy collection uh, at the library, we have one of the largest uh, genealogy collections in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we have uh, a two genealogy librarians full time. Uh, you know, we work in special collections, so we do a little bit of both. Uh, but we're here, and and our primary you know function is to to help people uh, with their genealogy. We have a number of online databases uh, that are available uh, for patrons to use remotely. Uh, and for us, of course, when we're helping people with their genealogy research. Uh, we have appointments. Uh, we have regular one-on-one -on -one genealogy appointments where people can schedule them in advance. We do a 30-minute appointment with them. Prior to closing, uh, uh, due to the pandemic, you know, we had regular desk hours. Uh, Mahina and I would be scheduled uh, uh, for several hours each day. Uh, we take phone calls. Uh, people drop in, uh, ask us questions at the desk. Uh, we'll sit down with them and, and, and look at their genealogy and do some research uh, in the databases. Uh, we also do classes, genealogy classes, uh, and a tour of the collection at the Central Library. Um, I've done one for several years just on using the genealogy databases like Ancestry, Heritage Quest, Digital Sanborn Maps, Seattle Times uh, database, and so on. Mahina has done a, uh, a Beginning Your Family History class uh, for several years, and, and we also do, do one-offs where we do a, a class on a topic uh, that someone has requested. I'll just chime in that the best service that we can offer the Seattle public is us because John and I are both specialists in genealogy, and we may not know every single thing about genealogy, but we know how to find it, and we know how to get to the sources. So no matter what the question is, even if it's not our specialty, like a specific topic that we might know the most about, um, we do know how to find the resources, and we can point people right to where they need to go. Mahina, can you describe how you and John have pivoted to a more uh, remote environment or or, or platform of service. With the closure of the building, um, we don't have folks walking up to the reference desk anymore. We are still getting lots of people writing to us through the Ask Us option on the library's website. And anything that's even remotely related to genealogy, those questions get filtered to John and I, and we answer those in this quick a fashion as we can manage. And then our appointments are no longer in person, but they are still either face-to-face -face over a platform like this. We use um, online software to talk to people. And we also do phone calls, whatever works best for the patron. We promoted the appointments that we're doing virtually on Instagram, which is something we don't normally do, but we got a few new people that had never heard of our services before. So it's been really great to see that new people are reaching out to us to talk about their genealogy. Now, what's available from home for people to remotely explore their family tree and fill in those blanks there? Almost all of our databases are available from home with your Seattle Public Library card and PIN. However, the big database that we often start with, Ancestry, has not been available from home over the history of Ancestry. However, with the closure of the buildings across the country, Ancestry has allowed libraries to offer Ancestry from home. So you can use Ancestry 
almost identical to Ancestry.com with some, some small differences at home with your library card. That's been the biggest benefit. So Ancestry, America's Genealogy Bank is a big one. The Seattle Times database, which is the Seattle Times newspaper. And for those of you looking for obituaries, birth notices, marriage notices, your grandpa in the newspaper with a sailboat, any of those things, you can find the picture, the text from 1895 to 1984 for the Seattle Times and 1900 to 1985 for the Seattle Post Intelligencer. As far as resources that are available from home, there's so much that's available online uh, right now. When I say that, I have to pause and say, but everything's not online because I don't want to give the impression that, that you will be able to get everything that you need there. Um, but just with the work that Family Search has been doing, you know, over the past 10 plus years, uh, digitizing all of their collections, there's, there's a huge amount that's available at your fingertips. As we've been working remotely from home, uh, we've been relying as much as we can on, on remote resources, our own databases or otherwise. Uh, and I'm often, you know, just, just very impressed by, by what you can get done without having print resources. Uh, there are still uh, many, many resources that we have in print that we're making available to patrons remotely by, by scanning pages or doing lookups and things like that. Um, so they're, they're definitely very important, uh, uh, but there is quite a bit that you can get, get online just with free websites, uh, databases, uh, family search, and, and otherwise. Now, I'd love for each of you to answer, what is an underrated tool for filling in the gaps in our lineage? Is there some source that you find um, maybe surprising to people that where they can find some information about their backgrounds? There's so many different resources that you can choose from. And, and oftentimes, you know, that one source that's overlooked may be unique to a particular community or um, ethnic background or place. Uh, where the records exist there, but nowhere else. And you sort of discover them as you start to research your own history and, and you start to become the expert there. There's some things like, like land records, buying and selling property, things like that, deeds that have a huge amount of information uh, between, you know, who's witnessing, who else is is at the land office at the, on the same day, at the same time, who you're buying and selling from. Uh, there's often clues uh, to that and who the neighbors are because families often move together. So by, by, looking, you know, really in detail at those records and not just the one, you know, for your family member, but for those uh, around, there's there's a a lot of clues to be had there. Other resources like uh, U.S. Census records, you know, it's a standard uh, that we use uh, every 10 years for U.S. research to find our families. It's kind of like time travel, but, you know, prior to 1850, uh, they didn't list everybody in the household by name. It was just the head of household uh, and then tick marks. Um, for everybody else. And so a lot of the times uh, people will look at that and say, well, they're really not so useful anymore. Uh, but but you can still uh, try and figure out who might be in the household based on the ages. And you can use things like looking at the neighbors uh, uh, and other pieces to, to try and really flesh out uh, this record to, to see more than, than what you might at first glance. Yeah. Like John mentioned, there's some kinds of records that are very specific to different places and groups of people. Um, One of my favorites is dog licenses in Ireland. Um, Ireland is very and has been very rural and pastoral. So a lot of people have sheep, for example. And if you have sheep, you need sheep dogs. And you had to pay for those sheep dogs with a license. So maybe you couldn't find your ancestor on any other record, but they show up on that licensing for their dog. There's so many things that we know of as genealogists that are very common, but newspapers are huge. Like that's probably one of my number one things, which can be very boring to search newspapers until you find that one really cool article, city directories, because you know the census for the federal government is only every 10 years. So what are you gonna do in between those 10 years? Or in the case of the 1890 census doesn't exist at all. So you have a gap between 1880 and 1900 that you have to fill with records. And then um, don't forget the second page of things. That's my big tip. Um, especially for passenger lists, for those later New York passenger lists. And by later, I mean after like 1900 or so. The first page will often tell a little bit of information about the people traveling and where they are going to. The second page will often list where they came from and maybe the name of a relative from the country that they left. So those are really important things to take a look at. That's fascinating. I love the Irish dog licenses. (laughs) That's incredible. Now, do you have a special story of a connection you helped someone make to fill in some of the gaps in their ancestry or even living family members? Yes, I definitely have helped lots of people with a lot of different kinds of 
interesting and poignant connections. Genealogy is about people. And so a lot of the times we're helping people with very sensitive and um, relevant to their personal life information. It's, it's their family. You can't get much more personal than their family. And we do help a lot of folks that are adopted try to find their birth relatives. In one case, I had a gentleman and his wife walk up to the reference desk on the level nine desk on, at the central library. And he was pretty shy and his wife walked up. She said, hey, I, I heard you have genealogy help here. My husband just got his paperwork back from his adoption and he now has the names of his birth parents. We don't know where to start. And so I started digging around. This person happened to have been born out of the country and what was living in the US now. And I just did some digging with the names that he had given me. I found the names of the couple selling items on eBay. And then from there, I looked on Facebook and I found that this couple was married. They were still alive and was able to get them contact information for those people. I haven't heard back about what happened um, or if they reached out, but it's amazing what resources you can use to find people. John and I are very good at finding people. <laughs> Absolutely. John, do you have a memorable story? Uh, yeah, like, like Mahina said, there's so, there's so many. I mean, honestly, a great joy in what we get to do for a living is, is hearing people tell their stories. And, and it's so personal and so meaningful. I can remember times where somebody comes in and, uh, and, and they've just started doing this research and, and we simply just pull up Ancestry and, and find a census record. Um, and, and there they are, you know, on the page. Recently, uh, I helped a, a woman find her, her birth father and, um, and ended up, you know, communicating uh, with, with her and, uh, and her birth father um, uh, and sort of answering questions on both sides um, as this was new to both of them. A woman who came in years ago, you know, she was in town for a conference and she just stopped by uh, uh, just on a whim and uh, noticed we had a genealogy collection and we started chatting and, you know, I, I wasn't having a whole lot of luck. We, we, we were working together for a little while and then she decided to, to go off uh, and check out some other parts of the library. Meanwhile, you know, as a genealogist, we usually can't let things go. Um, so even after the patron is left, we're still researching. And um, so I was doing some looking online um, and, and other places and she, uh, she came back uh, a after, you know, exploring the library a little bit. And, uh, and I, I, I told her, you know, I found this really interesting thing uh, in this biography of Harriet Tubman, um, uh, because this woman's ancestor was from that same region, and we found mention uh, in, in the book. It was kind of just a, a serendipitous uh, a situation, you know, where she had come in on a whim. Uh, and then, you know, I ended up finding something in, in a source that I wouldn't usually think of for doing genealogy, but there it was. We had a, a very strong personal connection. We followed up via email afterwards and just a memorable, you know, memorable experience. That's incredible. Thank you both. How has the proliferation of DNA kits, at-home DNA kits, shaped genealogy work? At, at a basic level, DNA is, is another tool. You know, when we're researching families uh, over time, you know, we're looking for the tool that answers the questions we're asking, right? You start with your question and try and figure out what those answers are. Um, but DNA is a whole new tool that we haven't had access to before. Yeah. It started uh, in the early 2000s with Y-DNA testing, you know, so it was uh, Y-DNA testing and mitochondrial testing, uh, basically the male line and the female line, father to son, mother, mother to children. Um, and so you could just get a, a snapshot, these two branches, uh, you know, of, of your entire tree that you could look at. So the hope is, at least with the Y-DNA, is that you find some people with your surname and it, and it helps identify an area or region um, that, you know, that your family came from. A few years later, the autosomal DNA testing came out and, uh, you know, the different companies call it different things. But it's instead of just looking at those two lines, it's looking at at, at all of your tree, you know, your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents. Um, and, you know, we get a small amount, well, 50% from each of our parents and then smaller amounts as you go further up the tree. Um, but then you're, you're, you're looking at a wide spectrum of matches, people who share your DNA and therefore share a common ancestor. Um, so you're able to do things that you, you couldn't before. You could search the paper trail before, but the paper trail isn't always right and doesn't always match, you know, what the genetics tell you. Um, you know, with adoption, uh, finding birth parents, uh, this, this is a, a huge change in, in, in what they're able to do because um, your DNA is your DNA. 
Mahina, any thoughts on DNA? Yes, I'll say um, DNA testing can, like John said, it's a great tool. It can sometimes help support your paper trail. Sometimes it just proves your paper trail. Um, in the case of my husband's family, we had surprising results with the DNA testing and that led me to a whole different avenue of research. And for my own family, there was zero surprises. It was very underwhelming. And um, whenever I talk to folks about DNA testing, that's something I try to mention is that when you take a DNA test, just be prepared that something that you did not know may come up and you might have to handle the feelings about that. There's lots of surprises that can come out in DNA testing. And another thing to keep in mind with DNA testing, and we've all seen the great commercials from Ancestry, like the gentleman who, I can't remember if he thought he was Scottish and then he finds out he's German or vice versa, but DNA testing isn't that clear cut. And I think it's important to, to emphasize that your DNA is not your ancestral country of origin. So if I take a DNA test and it says that I'm French, but in the last five generations of my paper trail does not show anybody from France, and I have no cultural connection to France, I might not run around telling everybody that I'm French. Um, one you know, really important thing is, especially with people who might think that they're, they have slave heritage, or maybe they come from the South and they were slave, they had slaveholder ancestors. Maybe if you DNA test and you have a small percentage of African, but you did not grow up culturally Black American, African American, that might not be something to start telling everybody that you are. You don't want to necessarily proclaim yourself to be part of a community or a group that you did not grow up as a part of or have no cultural identity to with. It's complicated and it's it's tough when you look at it from that aspect. But we do we do have that happen. That's life. That's DNA testing. Honestly, so many things can come out. Um, and a DNA test doesn't change who you are. It just changes what you know about your ancestors. I think I'll, I'll share my own sort of test results. So. I'm part Portuguese, I'm from Hawaii. So my Portuguese heritage comes from Atlantic Island. So I have family from Madeira, the Azores and Cape Verde, Cabo Verde. And I grew up knowing that my family was Brava Portuguese. In Hawaii, that's a like a colloquialism for if your family has black heritage. And I knew that growing up, but I didn't really know a whole lot about it. But when I took my DNA test, it did indeed show that I have West African heritage, which lines right up with folks that have ancestry from Cape Verde. For me, that was exciting to find out that this family story was actually true and that I could then trace my ancestor to his, you know, I found his baptismal record in the Catholic diocese in Cape Verde. When you have this awareness about what your background is, I think it can help you make a connection to other, you know, other cultures, other areas, areas that you didn't really identify with previously. But now knowing that you you may have some of that in your genetic history, uh, you might be more open to exploring the history of that, that area, region. Both of you have mentioned that the tools we might use to find our ancestry may differ depending on our place of origin. I'm wondering if there are particular challenges that arise for some people descended from certain ancestral countries or cultures or regions of the world. Um, as you've both mentioned, you know, we know this country's history with slavery poses obstacles for descendants of slaves, for example. Can you speak to other similar roadblocks for people and ways to overcome those if there are any? Genealogy can only go as far back as the records will take you. And if there are not records to research, that's as far as you can go. So for example, I'm part Hawaiian. My Hawaiian heritage for a long time was oral. So the tradition for genealogy for me was oral until very recent, you know, the early 1900s, late 1800s. So I can only go back on the paper trail so far. So it's the same for different folks. If your family comes from China, after the cultural revolution in China, many genealogy records were simply burned. So in China, there are these genealogy books called Japu, and the Japu were burned. And in many cases, families don't have anything at all. They do survive in, in for some lucky folks, but once those are gone, you can't get them back. If you look on a, a census record and it says your ancestor is Bohemian, what does that mean? Maybe they came from Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic or Slovakia or whatever the name might be. Over time, political boundaries have changed, even if your ancestors didn't actually move. And where those records went, what happened to them, who kept them, that can be very challenging. Another big barrier is name changes. There's a great myth out there that 
your ancestor's name was changed at Ellis Island. Honestly, the folks at Ellis Island had better things to do, and they spoke many, many languages, so they weren't converting people's names. Uh, all they simply did was take the name off the passenger manifest, which was generally filled out in the country of departure. And so folks that came to the U.S. sometimes changed their name for a number of reasons. You know, we can't really guess at what they might be. We have to look at each family individually, but you have to dig through the different parts of your own family genealogy or your own family history to figure out where you're going to go for records. And what I often like to do is if you run out of records and you can't get past anywhere, you're stuck. There's nothing else to find for the paper trail. Research the history of the place that they came from. The peoples and the place that your ancestor came from is, is as important as the paper trail for your actual ancestor. Knowing a whole lot about Southern Italy can be very important to understanding why your ancestor might have left to come to the U.S. And in terms of folks who have enslaved ancestors, it's painful. It's a painful process due to the research. And you just have to know that 1870 is often the first year you're ever going to see your ancestors listed by name on a census record. Because before that, our country decided that your ancestor was not a real person and they were not listed by name on records. However, there are other sources to use. Because your ancestor was enslaved, they were considered property and property was dealt with in a different method than people. And so if you're researching an enslaved ancestor, you wanna look through wills and probate and anything that might include information about a person's property, which when you say that out loud, it feels a little insane, but it is the reality of what we have to do when researching folks who are enslaved, folks whose ancestors were enslaved. Any thoughts, John? Uh, yeah, right, right. So as, as Mahina said, uh, you know, for African American families pre-slavery, you're researching the slaveholder. So yeah, that's that's hard, unless you were fortunate enough to be uh, free uh, prior to the Civil War, in which case, you know, th there'll be other records that you could explore and go further back in time. As, as far as challenges, um, you know, we all start with with sort of the same basic template, right? We're trying to figure out the lives of a person, uh, of people who came before us. Um, and, and generally all of the records that were created were created for some other purpose, right? They weren't created so that we could, you know, come along uh, uh, centuries later and, and figure out, you know, where we came from. As Mahina said, right, if the records aren't there, you're, you're, you're stuck. Um, but every situation is different. Every person we work with is, is different. And what they come uh, to the table with, what they know, um, where they start uh, will impact what resources we use and what and what we can find. As we work with people over time, uh, they they become the experts in researching the particular areas uh, that their family came from. Mahin and I learned an awful lot along the way, and 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 we're very good at identifying what sources are available, uh, no matter what you're researching. Um, but but there are, are certain situations where it's just harder. If there's been huge amounts of record loss, um, you know, if we're talking about, you know, uh, wars over time, um, uh, uh, communities that are torn apart, uh, uh, refugees and, and, and so on, um, there is often not the paper trail um, that we would ordinarily use. And so you're looking much more at the cultural uh, historical background to try and learn more, you know, about what your family would have experienced. We have a, a number of guidebooks, handbooks, I think is how they're classified in our library catalog, uh, that talk about how to do research in different areas uh, with dif different ethnic groups, different countries, and so on. We're very often looking for those uh, to, to ferret out what, you know, what the unique re resources are that we can, we can um, help patrons use. And those don't always uh, have the answers. In some cases, there is no guidebook, and we start looking online at, you know, family search on their wiki, you know, to see if, if, if they've got some, some records they've microfilmed or digitized. And even that sometimes fails us. And we, and we go in and there's this great wiki page and you go in and, you know, how to get started, you click through and it's just a stub um, and there's nothing there. And, you know, you know, that, that it's going to be a little more challenging um, and you're going to have to rely more on the, on the, the cultural historical record um, and, and really root out any records that might be kept. With colonialism, there might be uh, be records in places that you, you don't really think about or wouldn't think about until you know that that history was there. It's so important to know about the history of the place that your ancestors are coming from. And we're constantly learning. I highly recommend webinars. Legacy Family Tree is a great resource. They have a lot of free webinars. 
And recently I discovered in research, doing one on Scottish heritage, that it is very common for women in Scotland for a long time to not change their surname. That you'll find them with their maiden name in many records. I had no idea. And I only learned that because I tried to figure out a little bit more about it. And there are some strategies that you can use to get behind a brick wall, as you call it. When you, you run out of records, you can't find anything else. Genealogy brick wall. Elizabeth Schoen Mills, who is a fantastic researcher, big name in genealogy, um, she has something called the fan club. Friends, associates, and neighbors. So when you cannot find anything else about your person, branch out. Go to a different person who might be in their circle. I especially love looking at aunts and uncles, cousins, go up and down your tree and try to figure out any way to get back towards your direct line. And another thing that's like just a, a good rule of thumb to do with a person is write out a timeline of their life. When were they born? Where was that? When did they get married? Where did that happen? You know, does the timeline make sense? I was recently helping somebody who their grandmother came from France and she was born in France in 1911. Her parents were married in France in 1919 but her father was living in Ohio in 1917. So that timeline doesn't work. That's not her biological father. On a later record, she does name his, him as her stepfather, but the family never saw that record and they just assumed that he was her biological father and there was just a, you know, a late marriage. So it's important to make sure that you have everything lined up and it all actually makes sense. Now, of course, these records aren't perfect, as you've just pointed out. What are some common mistakes one might discover in the course of one's research. Are there things we should watch out for as we scrutinize the information we find? Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. When you get started with this, uh, you have, you know, some preconceptions about, you know, uh, about who you are and who your family is. And um, you need to be able to set some of those things aside. Names were spelled in various ways over the years. Uh, uh, so you can't be tied to one particular piece of information that you have uh, as, as being the truth. As you start to explore these records, you'll find that there's a lot of variability in, in names and dates uh, and how people are listed and how uh, a census enumerator may have interpreted uh, uh, the name when it was spoken and how they wrote it down. Um, so there's all sorts of things um, where you just have to be open uh, to some variability. Other things is uh, people have a tendency to uh, you know, want to find things quickly. Um, uh, if you're just getting started, you might find a family tree online at, uh, at Ancestry in, in, in our database or, or elsewhere. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, you're three, four centuries back uh, and, you're, you know, uh, your, your question to us is, you know, how do I, how do I connect myself uh, uh, to this person in 1300? And, you know, we usually have to sort of say, well, let's, let's back up a little bit. You know, we really want to start with, with you. Start with yourself. Work backwards one generation at a time, one record at a time. Let's make sure everything is accurate before you go, go too far down that road. Family trees online are great uh, as a starting point, um, certainly for the more modern uh, in making connections and finding records. Um, but you really have to question, uh, is it right? Is it true? Um, um, uh, you know, is it accurate? Um, does the timeline make sense? Just because the name is right does not mean that it's the right person. You know, John Smith uh, could be the right one, could be the wrong one. There might be, you know, uh, uh, many living in, in one community. Uh, and even a step further, just because they have the same name and the same, you know, uh, approximate birth year and they're both from Illinois or wherever they happen to be from, uh, it doesn't mean that they're, they're the same. So you really have to be certain uh, when you're looking at each record um, that, you know, that, that each one connects to the next one in a logical fashion. When Mahin and I are looking at this stuff, uh, we're always trying to triangulate, trying to make sure that this person is that person uh, before we get too far down the road, because otherwise you're searching somebody else's tree instead of, instead of your own. And even after researching for years, uh, you know, you, you go back and look at research that you've done, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and, and you see things uh, that, that you wouldn't have seen at the beginning, um, because you know more um, uh, mistakes you've made, uh, things that you've learned uh, that your assumptions were incorrect. Absolutely. I cannot agree with John Moore. There is so much that you learn as you go. We've been doing genealogy, I think, quite a long time, if you combine our years together, and we still make mistakes. But that's 
that's part of it is you have to admit the mistake and try to move past it and try to find the accurate information or at least enough supporting documents for what you're trying to do. There is an actual genealogical proof standard. There's there's a guide out there on what to do and how to do it and how to make sure that what you're doing is to the best of your ability. You're exhausting all the records you could possibly find to prove or disprove this thing you're trying to do. And the inconsistencies are important. Don't ignore them because they don't support your theory. You know, look into them, unravel them, make sure that you are researching your own family because uh, how what a bummer would it be to be, you know, several centuries down the road and you are not in the right place at all. When you're just getting started, you really don't have any idea what, what records are available or how to navigate between them. And so, you know, it's not a mistake if you don't know about a record, but once you do, you'll realize that it, where you were looking was the wrong place entirely. Um, so not knowing where to look um, and looking in places that are unlikely to have the answer, um, I guess, could be considered a, a mistake that the beginners will make. Excellent. Thank you for those pointers. Now, if someone is inspired by this program to start researching their ancestry today, what's the first step they should take? <laughs> I say you start with yourself and work backwards. It is the simplest thing to say out loud, but it's true. And it's very hokey, but I love to say this. You are building a family tree. So you need to have a very strong trunk and very strong branches to support this whole beautiful tree that you are building. If you don't get the basics right, you don't have your parents on there, they're where they were born, where they're, you know, what year they were born, who they married, and then your grandparents and so forth, then you have a very unstable base to even build anything off of. So start with yourself, work backwards. Write down as much as you know. If you're comfortable, reach out to relatives. It does not have to be the oldest relative in your family, but that's a good place to go go with. Um, It could just be your cousin who happens to be super interested in genealogy and they've done a bunch and they can work with you. Again, just like a family tree that's out there, take everything they say as a research jumping off point. And Hey, you never know who has something. There might be a relative who may be not interested in genealogy at all, but you've started talking about it. So they're like, oh, you know, I have the family Bible. That came down to me. The family Bible is this like genealogy golden ticket where you hope to find it, but not a lot of people actually have it. They usually list births and marriages and all the good stuff that you want to know. Any thoughts, John? Yeah, yeah, um, de- definitely, you know, contacting relatives, uh, you know, immediate or, or, or further afield uh, to find out what's been done already. Um, starting with yourself, documenting it, er- everything that you know uh, is, is a key piece. When I first uh, started on, on this stuff, when I moved out to, to Seattle, I had um, aunts and uncles, cousins who lived over in eastern Washington. And, and I was fortunate enough to make trips over there. And, you know, there were just trunks full of old photographs and old letters and ephemera. There was so much rich material uh, that if I hadn't reached out uh, to find it, I wouldn't have the information that I have now. There's a huge amount online. So after you've figured out what you know already and what you can get from your uh, your, your immediate family is uh, you're clearly going to get started by looking uh, in resources like Ancestry Library Edition, Family Search, uh, uh, online sources that, that have huge amounts of information. Uh, You can find quite a bit uh, straight out of the gate. If if you know enough to start to get you back to, you know, parents, grandparents, a couple generations, um, it's very likely that you'll be able to find things uh, in in the record in these online databases. And and again, if you're you're lucky, you can then connect to another generation or two without too much trouble, carefully, of course. And when you're getting started with the records, if your family lived in the U.S., 1940 is kind of the the jumping off point because that's the first census that we have available to us because the census was taken every 10 years from 1790 on. It's still going on, but we can only see up to 1940. 1950 will come out oh next year, actually, 2022. Yay, that's exciting. April 1st. April 1st, yes, April 1st, 2022. Mark your calendars, people. It's a genealogy gold star day. Um, So 1940 is the year you really hope to have somebody born before. So for example, if your parents are born in 1960, you actually want to know who your grandparents were so that you can try to figure out maybe they're born before 1940. Then you can find your grandparents on a census with hopefully their parents and then move back every 10 years that way. And then from there, you would look for birth, marriage, and death, all the big life events that most folks have military records. You just want to fill in all the gaps that people might have in their life. If you think about the kinds of records that we're leaving on our own, like 
records that we might show up on. Your ancestors probably had similar records. Now, are there any tools people should be used for documenting this information they're discovering? Is there a way of organizing this electronically or should people be printing out hard copies of their discoveries? Family tree charts, uh, pedigree charts, ancestor charts, uh, family group sheets, um, things that you can record on paper, which are certainly useful just for, for capturing what's in, in your mind. Uh, and certainly when people come in to work with us in, in person, we use those pretty regularly. Um, there is uh, uh, online sites where you can build your tree, um, you know, some for free, some uh, not for free. Um, each, each has their own, you know, sort of uh, uh, depth and breadth of, 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 of ways to represent it or print it. There's family tree software uh, that you can download. Again, there's free versions. Uh, and then there's the silver and the gold, you know, editions, uh, depending on, on what you go with. Um, we often recommend people download a free version of a software, uh, kind of kick the tires a little bit, um, you know, figure out how it works, get used to sort of the idea of a family tree software, uh, figure out what it does that you like and what it does that you don't. Um, and then you have a much better basis to sort of choose amongst the different options that are out there. Um, you know, there, there's there's several that are, are well known uh, and you'll find lists online, you know, that, that rank them or give give some information about how long they've been around. But you know, ho hopefully you're going to use something that's uh, uh, that's not a fly by night as it hasn't been tested. You know, you're going to spend a lot of time and effort uh, to gather the information and to put it in one place. Uh, and the last thing you want is for that, you know, that to, to go away. I always say use whatever method of capturing your family tree that you will actually be comfortable with. So if you are a person who does not like using computers or databases, don't do an online family tree like Ancestry or Family Search, for example. Do a paper tree. Whatever's going to work for you, that's the thing that you should do. Um, and while you're working, print it out or don't print it out, but you should capture what you're doing. One method of doing that is something called a research log. So just writing down or typing out what you've done. So for example, perhaps later today, I go online to find a marriage record for my great grandparents. I might make a note in my research log that says, on this date, I looked here for this record and this is what I found. And so you have a log of what you've done. So not only do you not retrace your steps over and over again, you also have citations. So for some reason, you lose that printed paper or you delete that file or something happens to that record, you know you would at least look for it and where you found it so you can hopefully get back to it. And it can be tedious, but it is one of those things that, that can save you time later, even if it takes a little bit of time up front. Well, John, Mahina, thank you so much for your time and your valuable insights. Now I'd love to kick it over to Jana to kick off our Q&A section. All right. Let's see, where is Mahina and where is John? I'm gonna have you guys join me. Audio, video, excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, first off, I love that dog thing. <laughs> My husband's <laughs> Irish and it's like, okay, research the sheep dogs, that's amazing. Um, I also am thrilled to hear that Ancestry has made the library version as if you're on site more available to those of you who are at home and uh, that is a pretty wonderful thing. We have a bunch of questions coming in, but before I go there, I just wanna say thanks to everybody for your patience. Uh, our team has nerves of steel in the background as they work through um, making this, this possible and whatever technical hiccups happen, they're inevitable. So thank you team for, for working that out. There are several questions, and I think, John, Mahina, if both of you can pull them up, we'll just work down through the list. Um, if anyone out there has a question, please put it in the Q&A, not the chat. Don't raise your hand because I can't see you. Um, but let's go ahead and just jump in. And one of the first questions is, how do you record guardians on a family tree? Uh Family tree software is going to vary, so it depends on what you know, what format you're using, what site you're using. Ordinarily, there is uh, an option for adding more than one uh, set of parents, uh, and and then options for how you are, you know, categorizing that relationship. You know, is it an adopted relationship? Is it a guardianship? Um, those types of things. But it will really vary uh, from software to software, so you'll just have to poke around and, and see. All right. Mahina, let me know if you want to add, and I'll let you two 
you probably know who answers what and when without <laughs> without even sure. having to signal to one another. So what is the best way to preserve old documents and photos? I guess I'll jump in. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing it, but um, and we're not necessarily experts at that. None of us in our department are actually archivists, but um, you want to look for things that are acid free to hold your documents to keep your documents from degrading further. Um, keep them in places that don't get a lot of UV because you don't want the light to degrade them further. Uh, for photographs, if they're taped or glued to things, uh, mm. stick that now. Put them in some um, acid free protector sleeves. There's lots of different options out there, and there, there's actually a whole Society of American Archivists. If you really want to get deep into it, um, they have a website, saa.org, I believe is what it is. Um, so, yeah, if you've got Another thing they want to do if you have old photographs is if you do not have captions or who's in those photographs, try to do that as soon as you can. Don't write on a photograph himself, but capture what's there so future people will know who's in them. I, I can't even begin to imagine what it will be like with all the digital photography now. Unlabeled, unprinted, who knows? Who knows what it will be in yes. the future? Um, let's see, Dorothy had a question I'll around. I'll just add one thing, John. Oh, yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, temperature fluctuation is, is a big one. Um, so, you know, mm -hmm. don't store them in your garage uh, that's going to be very, you know, moist in the winter and maybe dry in the summer. So, so yeah, that's just another piece. Good. Okay. So, Dorothy had a question about the classes you described and are they available online and how do you find them? We, we haven't been doing any classes online. We've been doing the one on one genealogy appointments. Uh, we're hopeful that, uh, you know, we're nearing the end of the, the pan, you know, the pandemic as it has been experienced by all of us. Um, but, but yeah, if, you know, the longer this goes on, the more likely we'll turn to doing some online classes, but know that you can get help one-on-one uh, -on -one with us on all of the topics that we would ordinarily teach classes on. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. And then another question from Al, do you work with people who need help from another country? For me, it's Jamaica. Yes, and Jamaica actually has very good records online. Um, Family Search is a super good resource for Jamaican records. I've helped a few people in looking at different things there. And then um, depending on your family, they might show up on records in other places. For example, I was researching someone in Nova Scotia and they were mentioned in a will because they were a recipient of a slave from Jamaica. So you just never know when the records will show up. But there's lots. There's lots, lots. for Jamaica specifically. <laughs> All right, Al. And, Al, you've got a treasure trove out there. Generally, for uh, you know, researching in other countries, there's a standard set of records you're looking for, basic vital records, registration, birth, marriages, and deaths. Uh, oftentimes, church records then is the next tier. Um, and then it's going to vary depending on which country you're researching. Um, we often will go to family search. Uh, or look for a guidebook, uh, I think, as I mentioned in the video, um, to figure out what exactly the resources are for the place that you're researching. Nice, nice. We have a question from Patricia about how are military service records obtained? Uh, military service records, you can find quite a bit of uh, index information on Ancestry and Family Search. Uh, and then from there, you're going to be looking at the National Personnel Records Center. Uh, in St. Louis for U.S. military, and of course that will be different for other countries' military service. Um, yeah, and it'll also depend on on who you are and the person who served that you're trying to get information on. You know, the more recent the service, uh, the less public that information is going to be. Um, uh, if you are not directly related and you're looking for a modern record, you're probably not going to get very much. Uh, if it's old enough, uh, then anybody can get it. Gotcha. So we have another question around, on Ancestry, lots of newspaper records must be paid for. How are newspaper records obtained for free? Yeah, um, so Ancestry owns newspapers.com. And so you probably have seen, that might be something you saw pop up recently, a lot of newspaper.com connections. You do have to pay for a subscription. The library does not have a subscription. No public library in our area has one that I know of. And I, I do check every so often. So you have to hope for individual libraries to have subscriptions to things. So like our library, luckily, because the foundation has paid for it, has the Seattle Times and the Seattle Post Intelligencer. So for our city, we have really good newspaper coverage. Um, and then we have um, America's Genealogy Bank, which includes some newspapers for other places. And then, for example, KCLS 
Jefferson County Library System. They have another newspaper database. Um, I think it's called Newspaper Archives. And then there's like, we have the New York Times Historical. So it's bits and pieces in different libraries, but largely if you want newspapers.com, you just have to pay for it. <laughs> Sorry. That, there are a couple of other, uh, Mahita, that covers most of them. Uh, there's Chronicling America is a free okay. website, Library of Congress uh, uh, national project. Uh, most of the newspapers there are going to be sort of pre-copyright, pre-1920s. Um, and then also beyond that, there are a number of uh, state projects, you know, Indiana, California, some other ones uh, where, you know, the state library or archives or some other agency uh, has started their own project and has, and has got more materials. Um, prior to newspapers being online, uh, people would order the microfilm through interlibrary loan, and you can certainly still do that. There's many newspapers that haven't been digitized. Um, so, you know, if you don't want to pay for it, uh, then you have the option of trying to go through the pages. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's much easier to search for things when it's electronic and, you know, there's character recognition. Uh, you'll find things you didn't expect to find or know to look for. Nice, nice. Let's see, here's one. Um, it looks like this is from Sue and she's trying to figure out there's five years in her grandmother's life from the time she left a, a village in Russia as a servant girl till she boarded a ship to America in Liverpool as a tailoress. She knows that she speaks French. Any ideas? You know, are there clues in there that she could use? Uh, do you want to That's take a tricky one? Or, or, uh, <laughs> yeah, it'll no, be hard, is my that. guess. But, um. um, yeah, I, um, as somebody, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm multiracial, so I do have Polish heritage, so I'm a little familiar with Polish records. Yeah, it's very tricky. Um, if they're from Russia, Poland, they're probably from you know, anywhere in Poland, because Russia controlled the country for a very long time. And finding that short amount of time is really hard. You're going to hope that they might show up on a passenger list somewhere. But outbound passenger lists don't really exist for a lot of places like Bremen and Hamburg are kind of the only ones that you can really find outbound, which you may get lucky with Bremen. Um, but maybe on a city directory, if they're living in the UK, maybe. Um, speaking French is something that would have been common for somebody in the serving class, possibly, if they're living in Russia, because Russia was like super in love with France for a long time. Yeah, it's like a weird thing. Um, no, I have no real good answer for you. I'm sorry. But you could do um, an appointment. John and I could look at your question specifically and see if we look for records with her name, what we could find. So you could write us to ask us. Well, in fact, I'm glad you brought that up because we're running short on time here. And one of the things that we do have a number of questions and I'm sorry, we're not gonna to get to all of them. And we have a little echo. So um, what I just wanna say is, can you share again, how somebody who didn't get their question answered today, how they find you, how they can get to you and uh, tap you for your incredible support and knowledge. So ask us, so if you go to the library's homepage, there is a link that says, you know, if you have a question, ask us. Anything that's at all related to genealogy will come to Special Collections, which John and I are a part of, and we'll answer your question as best we can. Um, we will not build your family tree from you back to 1300, but we will certainly hold your hand along the way. We will do our best. We'll do a lot of digging for you. Um, we also do appointments. You can request an appointment either through that ask us or on our genealogy page, there's an appointment link, and the appointments are 30 minutes. Uh, we can sometimes go a little longer. So thank you. And um, yeah, the appointment is whatever you want it to be related to genealogy. The more we know ahead of the appointment, the more we can help you during our little brief 30 minute time. All right. And Lindsay oh. dropped that link into the, the I think, the chat. So uh, do take a look at that. You can click through to get onto these two. Go ahead, John, I interrupted you. Oh, I was just going to add that, you know, the, the ask us and the appointment are sort of two separate uh, uh, concepts. Both of them feed into our, our ask us queue uh, in terms of our, you know, responding. Um, the ask us is more for, you know, the question, uh, can you answer this? Uh, I'm trying to find this. Can you help? Uh, and the appointment is really more for an extended discussion. Uh, you know, we're, we're either phoning or uh, using video chat. 
Um, so we get, you know, we get some things that feel like questions that come into the appointment queue. So we might, you know, sort of triage that with an email to make sure that we really need to do the uh, the extended interaction. But but we're happy to do whatever works best for you. You know, I, I have a thought here. I'm wondering, we have so many really good questions and many of them are very general. Do you think you'd be willing to help us answer some of those and we can share them out with our guests today after the fact? Uh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. we're happy to do whatever works. Good. I think there's a lot of really interesting things here and, and it would be a nice thing to be able to share for those who we didn't get a chance to actually answer questions. So I just had to say thank you again. Oh, sorry, Amazon or somebody just came by. Um, <laughs> I just want to take a minute and I'm not sure where the echo is coming from. Might be you, Mahina. Might be on my phone that I'm using, so I can mute. Anyway, um, there we go. Uh, I just want to wrap up and just say a couple things. So again, John, Mahina, you two are treasures. And Seattle Public Library is full of treasures, uh, human treasures, physical treasures, but you two are treasures. And thank you for being part of this Discover Your Library series. We have found so much interest by the community and our donors and, and a broader community to learn more about what the library is doing. And while libraries had to reinvent itself and working differently, all of you are just doing incredible work and it's pretty inspiring. So thank you for that. I just want to finish up with one last or two things here and just um, say that this is a like a really important week, just like a year from tomorrow uh, or yesterday is a big year for genealogy for us. Uh, this is the week of uh, Library Giving Day coming up on April 7th. And you've maybe heard about it, but it's something that uh, really is key to helping us raise money to support the library and fulfill the four plus million dollar commitment we've made to the library for this coming year. And so what's really fun about it is Library Giving Day is something that we cooked up and it's turned into this big thing. And so we're on our way to about 400 library systems across North America who are signing on and sharing resources and really helping build community support for libraries across the country. And I think Seattle has been so generous and, and we're role models. We have tools to share because our community is such great supporters of libraries. So thank you for that. And I know that um, if you're interested and you are thinking about making a gift, now's good because there is a one-to-one -one challenge match up to $75,000, which is amazing. Thank you to two very generous board members. And so your contribution will be matched. And you can find all of that through the supportspl.org. And you know what all those things do is they allow us to support things like genealogy, uh, buying books for kids this summer. Um, right now, there's so much work going on with your next job as we have many, many people in the community looking for support and help as they search for their next thing. And we're really proud of that program because we're doing it in partnership with the Snow Isle Libraries as well as the King County Library. And so those things are, are what I guess are some of the best examples of all. Um, I think the last thing I just wanna say is that to the, those of you who are part of our library family, those of you, whether you're using the library or not, we just wanna say thank you and tap into the resources like John and Mahina. They have so much to offer and our library is there for you and everyone in the community. And with that, I just wanna close with one last thank you to you, John. Thank you to you, Mahina. 40 years of experience between the two of you. That is something. Thanks, so, Jonna. We, we, we really appreciate, appreciate uh, being able to talk about what we do and, and to share uh, a bit about that. So thanks for having us. All right. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you. And have a great day, everyone.